Hey fam, I want you to like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin, and don't forget to turn on your notifications. It's getting to be a disturbing pattern that a number of Trump nominees have refused to say that the 1954 landmark Supreme Court decision on school segregation, Brown versus the Board of Education, is settled law. Now you hear that and you wonder what does settled law mean? Settled law means the Supreme Court should never ever consider overturning a decision like Brown. One such nominee who felt this way is current Supreme Court Justice Neil Gorsuch, another now confirmed federal district judge, Wendy Vitter. Now here comes Trump's nominee to be the second in command at the United States Department of Justice, Jeffrey Rosen. He was asked about it today at a hearing before the Senate Judiciary Committee by a Connecticut Democrat, Senator Richard Brumenthal. Brown versus Board of Education correctly decided. S Senator, I I don't think that it would be a productive exercise for me to go through the most uh, thousands of Supreme Court opinions and say which ones are right and which ones are wrong. These are I, pretty simple questions. They are answerable by yes or no. Most lawyers, I suspect, would agree, based on knowledge of the law, that these two cases, pillars of our jurisprudence, were correctly decided by the United States Supreme Court. I, um, I, I have views about lots of Supreme Court cases, but I'm not being nominated for this position to be the Solicitor General nor uh, a judge. And I think in this context, the point I'm trying to make is that whatever the law is, whether it's the uh, decision I would favor or disfavor, I see it as the role of the Department of Justice to uphold the law such as it is, unless Congress or the courts change it. Well, just for the record, so we all understand, you're not nominated to be Solicitor General, but he or she reports to you, correct? Uh, so you yeah. are in charge yes. of the arguments that are made to the well, Supreme Court. You would be in a position to suggest that the Solicitor General argue that Roe v. Wade should be overruled. That's why I'm asking you this question. Same with Brown versus Board of Education. And, um, We're entitled to know your personal views. Scott, I'm going to start with you. You're a lawyer. You have all the legal experience of uh, any of us on the podium here. Uh -huh. One, should someone, <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs> yeah, should, should someone disclose their personal views on long-held statues such as Roe v. Wade and Brown v. Board? That's the first question. And the second part of it is, if their opinion goes against what is the Supreme Court precedent that we now think to be just decent humanity, right. what does that mean about them <laughs> holding office? I can tell you that every lawyer who's ever litigated or done appellate arguments has an opinion on the ultimate decision. Yes, Roe v. Wade was decided correctly. Yes, Brown v. Board of Education was decided correctly. Could have struck down segregation in our education system, and we knew the separate but equal in the education system simply wasn't functioning and wasn't right. Uh, and so both of those were decided correctly. Lawyers disagree with decisions all the time. The reason Rosen's uh, avoidance of that is so important is because as the number two in justice, you run the DOJ Department of Justice on a day-to-day -day basis. And if you do that, you do decide what positions DOJ takes. So, for example, if there's a case that's going to challenge Roe v. Wade, DOJ has to decide whether it is going to defend settled law that has been in place for quite some time, and by majority uh, judicial and legal standards, people accept it as, as the right decision, then if, the DO, if DOJ is going to take an opposite position and ask for the Supreme Court to overturn it, or Brown versus Board of Education, the number two, as well as the Attorney General, have a lot of say-so in that policy decision, as well as that legal decision. And so many of the appointees in the federal, for the federal circuit and federal court have been avoiding this. But the reality is, a better answer for them, even if they're conservative, even if they want it all overturned, is that um, these, the parts of these decisions that could be challenged are X, Y, and Z, and it's up for debate. I may not agree with them, but here's the thing. It is settled law, and I will defend it. I don't agree with, uh, with uh, punishment, uh, cruel and unusual punishment, where people, the death penalty, for example. But if I'm a prosecutor and that's the law, I'm going to defend it to the height. And we have many federal and state prosecutors who've taken that position after being elected to, uh, to, to be prosecutors or uh, leaders in the criminal justice field. Kelly, what's the communication strategy here in being evasive? 
if you're against it, you're trying to tell your base, hey, we're looking to overturn it, wink, wink, nod, nod. But if you're supportive of it, you don't want to uh, throw off your base and get them turned off before a presidential election. Why not just be honest with the American public and his base at that point? I mean, well, that's not anybody in the Trump administration's M.O., <laughs> honesty. So I'm not expecting that at all. The bar has been set so low for this administration. You know, the, the bar has been set so low. I really don't expect much from this administration. But I do want to note, uh, to Scott's point, how... Uh, when it comes to decision making, uh, specifically with the DOJ, how uh, definitive their answers typically are. But something that I wanted to point out that Rosen did say, he said, quote, whatever the law is, whether it's a decision I would favor or disfavor, I see it as the role of DOJ to uphold the law such as it is, unless Congress or the courts change it. So he kind of removed any power that the DOJ could have in that statement. I'm not saying he's going to uphold it. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that he's not going to lie because he might. But for it to be under oath, for him to say this at a hearing, he basically said that he's not going to touch this because Congress or the courts aren't going to touch it. And in fact, it. Scott, before I let you get no, in, I want to hear from quick. I want to hear from Joanna for one second okay. because I want to get to her because <laughs> you haven't heard from her yet. Uh -huh. Your thoughts on this? My thought on this is so it's it's been over 60 years since Brown versus Board of Education, the ruling of it, right, of, of this particular court case, which is instrumental, one of our landmark cases um, in in America in America's jurisprudence. Uh, my concern is 60 years after, right? We are dealing with some dire situations when it comes to the education of black and brown babies in America. Our schools are still highly segregated. That's just the reality of it. And our schools for our black and brown babies are still underfunded. And there are a lot of issues that would require the assistance of the Justice Department to take on. So if you have a, a, someone as... Um, Mr. Rosen, who refuses to take a position, it's kind of questionable. When something does happen, how is the Justice Department going to deal with it? And I'm highly concerned because the education of our black and brown babies is a huge concern of mine. It should be a concern of all Americans. I think so, but, but let me show your viewers, all of us, why this makes a difference and why this is a big deal. In Texas two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I'm sorry, three months ago, uh, the state of Texas challenged Obamacare or the American Health Care Act, right? And so uh, the judge went further in his opinion and said none of uh, the, the uh, American Health Care Act Care could yes. be enforceable, which was far beyond what DOJ, the government, had argued in their briefing, brief papers, and in their oral argument. They had argued that parts of it were unconstitutional, but that the other part, like pre-existing conditions, should stay in play. Now, when the judge's decision came, came forth, um, uh, DOJ was ecstatic because now they had an opening in the federal district court judge that was going to strike it down completely. Uh, a month or two later, a couple weeks ago, they then, in further briefings on the case, they argued that they supported now the complete evisceration of Obamacare simply because this federal judge who was a appointee, uh, a Trump appointee, and so from a policy standpoint, legal position standpoint, DOJ changed their position simply because, and simply because of this judge's decision, a preliminary decision. Now, having said that, number two, number one, and the senior people at DOJ made that strategic decision. That's why him not answering that question is relevant, probative, and material to whether he should get appointed or not. And that's why Kelly's addition to the conversation about I'm only going to abide by what the courts and Congress say because if yeah. you move out of the way and allow right. courts to change things, then you can reverse course yourself. Yeah. All right, folks, back to our Roll Mark Unfiltered video in just one moment. Calling all HBCU alumni. That's me, Scott, and I know you're one as well. Yeah, yeah all the HBCU Boy, alumni in the house. Yeah, yeah we're deep in here today. <laughs> <laughs> Calling all the HBCU alumni, students, and leaders. Enter the Ford Motor Company HBCU Mobility Challenge and win $25,000 for your school. Building on their long-term support of HBCUs, Ford is looking to improve mobility in HBCU communities through innovative solutions. The the winning program will receive a grant of up to $25,000 to implement their proposal. The deadline to apply has been extended to April 15th, 2019, tax day. Get the Ford application in and your taxes at the same time. Go to fgb.life, again, F as in Frank, G as in girl, B as in boy, dot life for more info. And to apply, Ford goes further in our community. Now back to your Roland Martin Unfiltered video.